Hello, uh, this is Dr. Zach Stainberg. I am the program director for Nephrology Fellowship here at the LSU Freeport. And um, what I thought today I'll, I'll do different is, is um, kind of take you over and introduce you to this vir vir visual abstract um, uh, world in, in medicine. Um, I've asked several of you how many of you are active on Twitter, and it turns out that it's a small number. Uh, I, I know in, internal medicine is trying to increase the foot traffic um, of their residents in, into the, uh, the Twitter world. And, and if you do go there, uh, you will find visual abstract as a, as a key tool used these days to uh, share information amongst um, the, the big audience in a, in a very easy uh, Twitter way, which is compress all the information into a, a very meaningful, quick take. I, I guess uh, the millennial generation, uh, including my kids who have a really short uh, attention span, um, do like this this way of, of information. So let me start off uh, just, just introducing uh, visual abstract to you guys. So this is a visual abstract about COVID-19 and, and kidney disease outcomes published by um, uh, Kidney International, um, the International Society of Nephrology Journal. And, and they kind of condense together um, all the key clinical information about COVID-19 and its impact on kidney disease um, in a simple visual abstract. Uh, the presentation in terms of the likelihood of clinical symptoms is on the left column in the middle, uh, the diagnosis and uh, what is the, the key features that you need to be um, looking into in, in, in your exam and in your history and uh, who are the patients who may be at a higher risk with this infection. Um, and then they found the outcomes with renal disease uh, in, in these studies where it showed that AKI uh, in a COVID-19 patient increased the in-hospital mortality. Um, and they postulated that it could be because of, of sepsis from the cytokine storm or maybe because of cellular injury directly by the virus. Since then, there have been some other studies that have really uh, looked at the autopsy CDs in kidney uh, injury patients, and I found a fairly uh, good evidence that, that direct viral injury to the tubular cells and to the endothelial cells in the kidney may be playing a role in AKI of uh, COVID-19 um, presentation. And so, so this is a, a quick way of, of Kind of glancing over what is uh, the the crux of the of the article. So let's go back to acute kidney injury. Um, so acute kidney injury is a is a new term. Um, not sure if uh, there are any of the older folks uh, who will be listening to the talk. Acute renal failure used to be the norm, and and about 15 years ago there was a big kind of debate about uh, acute renal failure being a negative term, uh, failure comes across to the patients as something that is irreversible, the patients are not going to get better. So the term acute kidney injury was coined and also there was a need to make the criteria used for diagnosis of a reduction in kidney function, if you will, uh, to be more consistent. Uh, and we can try and look at these inconsistencies in, in this uh, picture here, uh, which shows the incidence of uh, acute kidney injury in all hospitalized patients across the world. So if you look at uh, United States, uh, Europe, um, China, uh, you, you see uh, about one in five admissions in the hospital uh, will have acute kidney injury, whereas if you look at Southeast Asia, it may be a little higher, uh, but South Asia, North Africa, the incidence may be really low. Now, is it because of uh, less amount of testing? Is it because the, the criteria used to define AKI is not 
consistent across different countries. So, so this was widely recognized to be one of the factors why there were so such varying reports of different um, incidents of AKI. And, and about 15 years ago, the acute kidney injury network was established, a group of nephrologists, critical care physicians, internal medicine guys, who got together and, and, and tried to standardize the definition of acute kidney injury. Now, acute kidney injury um, will have several consequences. And uh, the increase in creatinine that is the hallmark of acute kidney injury does not go without long-term consequences to the kidney. And, and this is perhaps one of the most important uh, uh, aspects of kidney injury, uh, that, which was also behind the rephrasing of the term uh, acute renal failure to acute kidney injury. In patients where there is an elevated creatinine, and I've seen several of those patients in, in my clinical practice, if we do not recognize that this acute elevation of creatinine is not CKD, and we do not address that acute inflammation. Let's say this was a patient who had um, who had been taking ibuprofen at home, one of the very simple uh, but yet very common injury to the kidney, and and the patient's elevated creatinine is attributed to be a CKD. Uh, and the patient continues to have that exposure to the nephrotoxic agent, over the next 7 to 90 days, the injury to the glomerula is going to become permanent, and the patient will now develop CKD. Uh, the structural injury to the glomeruli, uh, I, I think of a glomeruli, and I, and I try and explain glomeruli to my patients as a sieve. Um, so when you have a sieve in, in, your, in, your, in your kitchen and then you're trying to use it to filter, um, say, flour or anything else, a brand new sieve may work absolutely fine, but it may get temporarily blocked because it, it may have some residue that has been sticking to that sieve. Now, if you are able to go in and rinse it and, and, and clean it, and, and clear that injury and clear that inflammation early enough, those glomeruli will recover back and go back being functional. But if that inflammation and injury persists and, and the sieve stays clogged up for several days, months now, that injury is going to become permanent now. And the consequence of that acute kidney injury is going to be a long-term, lifelong chronic kidney disease for the patient. Chronic kidney disease is irreversible by definition and will be a major risk for long-term mortality for that patient. So again, I'm going to emphasize here, acute kidney injury, recognizing that this is a acute inflammation, an acute injury, an acute insult, an acute drop in kidney function will help hopefully reverse the, the cause of that injury, the insult, and recover the kidney function before it's permanently lost. Kidney injury is not isolated uh, and it's not simply uh, a, a drop in a filter function leads to a back flow of fluid buildup in the body and, and, and volume overload. Uh, that is one of the functions of the kidney, filter the sodium and water from the body. So when the GFR goes down, you will invariably have volume retention, which will cause a consequence, a consequential increase in blood pressures and intravascular volume. But there are several other much less recognized insults that, that also come with acute kidney injury. Um, cytokine activation in the heart decreases heart function. Uh, acute kidney injury and associated inflammation has been uh, 
uh, associated with a decreased ejection fraction in the heart. So now uh, there are syndromes described which are called cardiorenal, um, but but rather be renal cardiac, uh, cardiorenal type four, where the renal injury is actually causing cardiac dysfunction. Um, it'll have a bone marrow suppressive effect with worsening anemia and, and coagulation disorders. It's been shown to increase inflammation in the liver uh, with increased leukocyte influx and, and uh, uh, decrease antioxidant levels within the liver. Um, increased permeability and, and risk of uh, alveolar edema uh, can increase with severe inflammation. And then there are neurocognitive effects also seen in patients with acute kidney injury. So it's not a disease in isolation. It does affect several other uh, parts of the system as well. And cumulative uh, will have wide spread effects on the body. If you look at the, the outcomes of patients who have a diagnosis of AKI, so a patient gets admitted to the hospital, and in this particular study uh, from Canada, they looked at about 150,000 admissions of AKI, right? And uh, they looked at the cause of death in those patients. What was so striking was that in patients with a diagnosis of AKI, the mortality after leaving the hospital was about 25% or close to 30%. So one in four patients died within a year of a diagnosis and a hospital stay due to AKI. And what was also very striking was that the deaths were very high uh, because of heart disease and then some because of cancers. So maybe AKI is a marker uh, maybe, or, or cancer patients at a higher risk of AKI and, and they have a high risk of, of uh, death. And, and the AKI patients may have an increased cardiovascular mortality uh, in the next year. So think of it next time when you have a patient on, on your floors and, and, you have, and you're writing a diagnosis of AKI, one out of those four patients may not be with us. Patients who have had uh, an AKI diagnosis, and, and uh, if you look at their follow-up post-discharge again, in, in this particular cohort of almost 31,000 patients, um, they had a much higher risk of heart failure within a year of discharge. It did not show that they had a higher risk of myocardial infarcts or peripheral arterial disease or strokes, but predominantly heart failure. Again, we recognize that a drop in kidney function will increase the risk of volume overload developing in these patients. Cost of care is mounting. Um, Medicare is always looking at, at ways to decrease hospital length of stay, decrease the cost of medical care. And, and simply a diagnosis of AKI in the hospital increases the cost. If you had this AKI patient getting dialysis, now the cost has gone up way higher. The length of stay of the hospital in an AKI patient is more than a patient without AKI. And if you've had an AKI with dialysis, the length of stay is understandably going to be much longer. So consequences of AKI are not renal limited. They are widespread in the body. They go from uh, kidney to multi-organ dysfunction really fast. There, is, there are long-term mortality risk and increased risk of volume-related changes as a consequence of likely CKD developing in, in patients. So, for, yeah. so understanding these risks is really important. And again, understanding that AKI is reversible in an acute form, and if left unchecked, it's gonna progress on to CKD is really important.
There's another study which is looking at the cost of care of AKI in, in um, different stages of AKI, and, and we'll go into the stages in just a little bit. So if you have patients who are admitted to the hospital, and, and there's a big cohort of patients, 239,000 patients in Alberta, Canada, if your patient did not have any KI, there's over about 86% of the patients. So in, in Alberta, Canada, uh, the risk of AKI was about, or the incidence of AKI was about 14%, right? So those are down below. If you had no AKI, your mortality was 3% in hospital mortality. One year mortality was 12%. Length of stay was nine days. If you had stage 3 AKI, which is uh, an elevation of creatinine of 200% of from baseline, and we'll go into that in a little bit, those patients were fortunately only 1% of the total admissions. But look at that. Their mortality was 10 times higher than the patients who were admitted without an AKI. 3% versus 34%, and a one-year mortality of 50%, 50% one year mortality. And if you went into dialysis while you were in the hospital, your chances of leaving the hospital were about one in two. So AKI has long-term and acute short-term consequences patient. So what are some of the risk results? You had almost a 40% increased risk in 20,000. And in, in this study, 16,000 patients had no AKI. <coughs> and and I, the reason I bring out these two studies is, is to identify that the risk of AKI is not alone by one agent. And the way we diagnose AKI may be one of the reasons why we are so divergent in terms of recognizing AKI when it may be there. So I'm gonna talk about that in just, uh, just a little, uh, just uh, again. But I also wanted to point out that, that there, there are other factors that, that are sometimes responsible in, in diagnosis of AKI. So, so let's look at this study, uh, SPRINT trial. Uh, and if you have not looked at SPRINT trial, I'll urge you to pull up uh, SPRINT trial as, as you uh, go about your days uh, at, at home these days. Uh, SPRINT trial was a landmark study that led to American Heart Association's recommendations to lower the goal blood pressures in populations above the age of 50 with cardiovascular risk from 140 to less than 130 millimeters of mercury. So they had divided patients into two groups. Um, patients, 9,000 people were divided into the intensive arm versus the standard arm where the blood pressure goal was less than 140 versus a blood pressure goal of, of 120. Uh, systolic blood pressures were maintained at 120 um, in, in the intensive arm. The risk of AKI in, in patients with a lower blood pressure was higher. So again, I'm going to try and, you know, have you kind of think about it for a minute. So the injury to the kidney occurred more likely because your blood pressures were low. And in the prior studies with contrast, the injury to the kidney seemed to have occurred in some patients when they got contrast, but not in other patients when they got the same contrast. Why is it so? What is it that's happening in the kidney? And what other factors may be contributing to that injury is, is a subject of, of a lot of uh, research but it's also clinically very important in recognizing that not all patients may have the same effect when you put them or put their kidneys through a stress. 
And that's a very important point that I wanted to bring out with, with the abstracts. So with that, let's just go into how do we get those API? And, and perhaps you will use those risk uh, information that, that we talked about and, and uh, then put this into this slide. So what are we looking at here? So how do we diagnose AKI today um, in, in 2020? Uh, unfortunately, is is still through looking at patients who have a elevated creatinine, right? So if your creatinine is elevated, we say you have acute kidney injury, and then I'll, I'll tell you uh, how do you go into the stages based on how much creatinine is elevated. But before we go there, let's try and think of it uh, in, in a different concept. So, so I'm saying that the creatinine is elevated and there is a, a damage to the kidney, right? So there is a, a renal injury, a tubular injury, let's say, ATN, or maybe a glomerular injury, acute glomerulonephritis, or it could be an interstitial injury, an acute interstitial nephritis, right? Well, all of them are clubbed together as intrinsic AKI. So your creatinine is elevated and you have signs of tubular injury. So you have a classic AKI. But think of it in another way. What if your creatinine is elevated because the patient was just dehydrated, right? If I dehydrate myself, and I've done that on several occasions, if I'm out by, you know, working in my yard for several hours and, and you know, because I'm so messy that I don't want to walk back into the house and then drink some water, my, I'm really thirsty. And if I do go back and, and drink some water or, or, or use the restroom, you will recognize how dehydrated you are, right? Now, under those circumstances, if you check your creatinine, you will find your creatinine to be elevated, right? But fortunately and hopefully, there is no damage to the kidney itself. So this is what you would classify as a pre-renal azotemia or maybe a pre-renal renal dysfunction, but there is nothing wrong with the structural integrity of that filter. The sieve is not broken, the filter is intact, the glomerula is working fine, and there is no damage to the structure of the kidney itself. The last few years, we've also started recognizing that there may be conditions, there may be circumstances where the kidney filter does get damaged. You do bump your kidney against some nephrotoxic agent. The car gets a little dent somewhere, but it's a minimal dent. It's not going to affect the, the running of the car. The car is still going to run without making any noise, but it's going to leave a little scar. A few of those gloms are damaged. But because there is immense capacity for the rest of the glomeruli to, to pick up the slack for those 10 gloms that, that did kind of burn out when the patient got the gentamicin, the rest of those 90% of the gloms are going to take up that slack and work a little extra. Each glom may pitch in a 0.1%, 0.2% extra, and now the entire function appears normal. So when there is damage to the kidney, but the function as we measure right now, the creatinine remains unchanged, that's what is called the subclinical AKI. And there is a lot of interest, there is a huge amount of interest in the kidney world right now to try and identify other markers from within the kidney that may go up when there is an injury to the kidney. These markers may be present in the tubular cells, they may be present in the, the podocytes of the kidney or within the endothelial cells of the kidney, uh, perhaps um, in the interstitium within the kidney. And, and if those markers go up, irrespective of whether there is a drop in function, it may help us, it may alert us of a impending kidney injury or an ongoing kidney injury and, and the, probably the right word would be an impending drop in kidney function. It's almost similar to the story, um, if we go back two or three decades with, with the cardiac uh, diagnosis of myocardial infarction, we used to diagnose myocardial infarction by looking at an echocardiogram, uh, 
and, and seeing a reduction in, in the ejection fraction. And that would be a, a very late pickup of myocardial infarct. And, and by that time, the muscle tissue is all dead and that fibrotic muscle tissue is never going to come back. So only after you have a biomarker, the troponin, which can diagnose that injury in real time. And I wish my kidneys made some noise when they were getting injured, when they were getting ischemic. The poor kidneys don't cry, they don't yell, they don't mount a fever, they don't throw blood into the urine. And because that injury is so silent, unless we routinely check for a biomarker and, and find that subclinical injury, we are handicapped by diagnosing kidney injury only when the kidney function goes down. All right. So, so try and wrap your head around this concept of, of silent kidney injury when the biomarkers may be positive, there is evidence of clinical normalcy in the kidney, but there are signs of some structural injury to the kidney. The myobarker is positive. Functionally, the kidney is working fine. And then perhaps there are truly no injury to the kidney when both the biomarker is negative and obviously the creatinine is going to be negative. In, in those. So let's kind of review another visual abstract. Uh, this is an interesting study done in uh, a group of uh, 22 people who were running a marathon, right? So what they did was they, they looked at their uh, kidney function and two very commonly used biomarkers, kidney injury molecule one and uh, Gosh, I'm blanking on the name of NGAL. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's a molecule that's produced via leukocytes, and NGAL has been very tightly linked with some forms of kidney injury. And they looked at those markers, and these markers were normal before, you know, these people did not have any signs of kidney dysfunction based on the traditional way of diagnosing AKI. And they UA positive for, uh, they did not have any proteinuria. And they did have some signs. Some of these people had maybe, or maybe one out of 22 patients had something in the urine which was suggestive of AKI, probably had some red cells or, or, or white cells, right? Then these patients were, or these people were seen immediately after they ran the marathon, they had their blood tested, the creatinine went up overall quite significantly, 0.8 to 1.28. There was minimal elevation in CPK. But look at the Kim 1 and NGAL molecule. They were both statistically and significantly elevated right after the, the marathon. The urine had much more hematuria. Almost two out of three people who ran the marathon had some hematuria, and there was some minimal increase in, in albumin in the urine as well. These changes reverted back the next day. The creatinine got better, right? So the function of the kidney came back, but the KIM-1, the marker of of structural injury to the kidney continued. So perhaps a perfect example of a subclinical injury, and I'm not saying that those of you who run a marathon should stop running, or if you are on a treadmill while listening to the talk, should stop running. But there is some concern that there is injury or some insult occurring to the kidney as we run or as we do a stressful activity. And it is reversible and over time will go away. Does this have any long-term consequences? There is no study to date that suggests that marathon runners have a higher risk of CKD that I know of. So please keep running and stay healthy. Don't quit 
on, on being active just because I told you that marathon running increases the risk of AKI. So over the last 10 years, we have kind of gone and, and tried to consolidate and, and come up with a uniform criteria to define AKI with creatinine, which is the best marker we still have available to, to diagnose AKI. And this, this, this definition has kind of gone, undergone a few changes over time. The first definition uh, defined kidney injury as using the RIFLE criteria, R-I-F-L-E, R being risk, I injury, F failure, L loss, E end stage renal disease. And then it was redefined and, and changed into what we currently use is the KDGO classification, uh, where stage one kidney disease is a 50% elevation from baseline. So if the patient's creatinine was 0.5 and the creatinine goes up to 0.76, which is a 50% elevation from baseline, that patient with a absolute creatinine of 0.76 has EKI stage one. Or patients who had an absolute increase of 0.3 from their baseline, the patient's baseline creatinine was 0.7 and the creatinine has gone up to 1.0. That by definition is EKI stage one. If the creatinine doubles from baseline, from one it's gone up to two or 0.5 has gone up to one, that patient has a stage two AKI, and then stage three AKI, a 300% increase from the baseline. The group of physicians who were working on, on redefining AKI also recognized that creatinine elevation is delayed. They also recognize that creatinine elevation may not be a very good marker of of checking somebody's drop in kidney function. So they also added a more sensitive criteria, the urine output criteria. So the point being that if you have a patient who may be developing AKI today, now, your patient in ICU, and, and that patient's urine output at 12 noon was one cc per kilo per hour, but by 3 p.m. it has dropped to less than 0.5 ml per kilo per hour and continues like that till midnight, you need to be worried about that patient developing an AKI. Perhaps that nephrotoxic medicine that you had given in the morning, the gentamicin or probably an NSAID or probably the contrast that the patient got in the morning or perhaps let's say the patient is supposed to get a contrast that, that afternoon should all be recognized as, as a potential risk of an impending AKI, if not that the patient already has an AKI. So the urine criteria makes the diagnosis of AKI more sensitive. Why stage? Again, if you look at this graph on the right, uh, patients who had no AKI had much less mortality, just similar to that big Alberta study that we looked at earlier. Uh, Stage 1 AKI, a little higher hospital mortality, and stage 3 AKI had almost close to 50% mortality um, within a month of, of that diagnosis of AKI. So diagnosing AKI and then labeling them according to the, the elevation of creatinine does have a prognostic significance for the patient. And I'm sure your patients would want to be aware of, of what the potential risk is. And, and we should be more diligent in, in recognizing the AKI early and then trying to reverse the cause of that AKI. We talked about those biomarkers earlier. Um, and I think uh, this is a good slide to try and review some of those biomarkers. And I'm not going to go into the details of, of uh, uh, where we are and, and, and as of now, we only have one biomarker that is clinically approved for use in uh, diagnosing of AKI in ICU setting. Um, we use a combination, the, the, the test is called NephroCheck, uh, 
So this is uh, a study, uh, sorry, FDA approved test for patients who are getting admitted in ICU. So let's say you have a patient who just moved into ICU. As he's rolling into ICU, your creatinine is normal, right? So in that patient, if you would check a nephrocheck test, it's a bedside test, and it's a combination of t uh, tissue uh, mel uh, melanoproteinase 2 and insulin-like growth factor binding protein 7. So these two tests combine, and if it's positive, even with a normal creatinine at the time of admission into uh, the, the ICU, the, it, the positive test is going to predict that this patient is going to require dialysis in the next few days. So now you could be a little more vigilant of that change. You could perhaps hold back some of those uh, nephrotoxic therapies like a contrast uh, study that you were going to expose that patient to and, and hit and prevent further insult to a already stressed yet subclinically evident injury at the time when the patient moves I see you. <clears throat> I mentioned the, the shortcomings of creatinine and, and here's a list of, of all other cause, reasons why creatinine is not a good marker for, for, for diagnosing a care. There's certain uh, medications that may interfere with secretion. We've known that. And this is sometimes commonly tested in the boards as well. So you start the patient on trimethoprim, uh, a drug commonly used for infection. It's, a, it's Bactrim, which is sulf sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim. It blocks the tubular secretion of creatinine, so the creatinine levels in the blood will go up. If you have decreased creatinine levels in the body, so these are patients who are frail, elderly, patients with liver disease, patients who already have severe sepsis, the rise in creatinine is going to be much less because the total load of creatinine is low and, and you will be underdiagnosing AKI in these patients. If you, <clears throat> every year I get about one or two consults or I see patients who are really healthy, young, active, and they take in a lot of creatine supplements. If you go to GNC store, you can buy a whole gallon of, of creatine and, and uh, eat a, several spoons of that every day. Guess what's going to happen? All that creatine is going to be broken down in the body into creatinine, and the creatinine is going to raise your serum creatinine level some. The kidney is going to try and flush all that creatinine out. Eventually it will, but in a steady state, if more is going in, more is coming out, the level within the blood is going to be a little higher. So it may appear like the patient has a renal disease when in, in reality the patient does not. So there could be several other medications that may actually interfere with measurements. If you have a patient with jaundice, they may have a misdiagnosed uh, AKI because of the interference of the, of the creatinine test that's being used in the acid. And similarly, um, a very common error that I see all the time is that you have a patient who comes in with a creatinine of two, right? And, and what's the next thing we do is, is uh, give the patients IV fluids, right? Because uh, every patient who's admitted with an AKI diagnosis is volume depleted. Uh, in reality, um, only about, I would say, 30 to 50% of the patients who are admitted with an AKI are prenatal. And that is actually the most common cause of AKI or an elevated creatinine. So you do and, and you should um, replace volume in one out of two patients who have an AKI from pre-renal reason. But in about half of the other people, uh, the, those patients may be volume normal or, or maybe even volume high because of that AKI, right? So in a patient with an elevated creatinine, when we give uh, volume and, and the, let's say the patient has had a kidney injury intrinsic and this patient is not pre-renal, even though the volume is not going to increase the GFR, the volume is going to dilute the amount of creatinine that's already present in the blood. So imagine that there were 10 molecules of creatinine 
in five liters of blood, right? And you gave the patient five liters of saline, right? That is going to dilute those 10 molecules now in 10 liters of volume. And the serum creatinine level, which was two, may drop down to one. And this is a very well-recognized phenomena. So when you give IV fluid bolus to patients with AKI, creatinine does not get cleared by the kidney, but the levels come down because it gets diluted by that increased volume that's in the patient. So I'm going <clears> to <throat> go back to that, that, uh, that schematic, which is trying to a certain different types of potential kidney injuries. When you have no damage to the kidney, no functional change, that's, those patients will probably have the best prognosis, the creatinine is not elevated, and the biomarkers are negative. Compare those two patients where, who have a high biomarker, a very high amount of functional loss to the kidney, those patients who have very severe injury, the clinically evident AKI, and we know that they have really bad prognosis. And then there are some patients perhaps who have an elevated biomarker, but they do not have any functional change. These are the patients who are compensating their loss of that kidney disease. And these are the patients that are currently getting underdiagnosed, unrecognized, and we may be missing the injury. So let's go back and think about that contrast-induced nephropathy uh, debate about whether contrast cause injury to the kidney or not. So in, in the study where you had perfectly healthy young 20-year-old getting a contrast exposure, and the patient's kidney function was absolutely normal. All hundred thousands of gloms were perfectly normal functional. And you give the patient contrast, and, and now you have, say, about you know 1% of the gloms die, right? 99% of the gloms are working fine. The creatinine is not going to change. The biomarkers may go up, but there will not be any sign of overt clinical kidney injury you will find the study to be negative and they, you will label that contrast would be safe. So if you're not looking or the tool that you're looking, you, the, the tool that you're using to look and identify that injury is, is inept or, or incapable of, of finding the injury, then we may falsely attribute that test or that condition to be safe when in effect it may not be safe. Right? And then the, the drawback of using creatinine could also be that if you're using creatinine as a marker of kidney injury and you have a patient who's simply dehydrated, you diagnose that patient as having an acute kidney injury because of an elevated creatinine, but in effect there was no injury to the, to the gloms or, or to the filter itself. It was merely a decrease in perfusion to the to the filter that caused an elevation in the creatinine. And in these patients, when when all you do is, is you open the tap up and the filter starts functioning absolutely normal. The filter was never at fault. And, and these are the patients who falsely get diagnosed at AKI and, and may make any treatment or, or the, the uh, management of that physician's look even better because the AKI will reverse really fast. Needless to say, there was no damage to the kidney, and all that was wrong was that the inflow was low, and, and if you correct it, things will get better. And I'll also I'll urge you, and I'll, and, and, and I'll try and uh, impress on you that the structural injury recognition or recognizing structural injury by the use of biomarkers is not currently available clinically. We do have the clinical availability of urine analysis, which may serve as a marker of tubular injury, or may serve as a marker of glomerular injury. 
to that marathon study which looked at patients who had uh, um, tubular injury, they were looking for renal tubular cells. Right? Renal tubular cells are widely present in, uh, in, in, in even in normal urine. You may see in occasional urine, uh, tubular cells. But the moment you have tubular injury, now you will see these big, large tubular cells and they are about, so if you see these red cells at the bottom, just below, tubular cells are almost three to four times the size of those red cells. They have a very prominent nucleus, they're kind of spherical, um, and if you see those, you should think of tubular injury, right, even though the creatinine is normal. If you see dysmorphic cells, cells that have broken down cells within the, the kidney, that is a sign of glomerular injury. But if the cells are normal looking red cells, then that's a sign of immaturity that could be coming from a renal stone or say the bladder itself. Red cell cast, a very clear and in hallmark of glomerular injury. Leukocytes in the urine, infection, a leukocyte cast a sign of interstitial disease or likely infection in the body. So the best biomarker that is clinically available is actually free. And if you have a patient that you worry about, that they may have had an acute injury and the creatinine is not high yet, are you giving somebody vancomycin? Are you giving somebody gentamicin? And you worry that you may be exposing that patient to at a higher risk of, of developing AKI, maybe do a screening UA and, and get the urine to be spun at our lab and we can look at and, and see if there is any sign of a subclinical injury to that patient and perhaps we could stop those toxic therapy and, and prevent further clinical injury to that, to that patient. <laughs> Now, going in future, looks like you know we, we have some of those tools already available to us here. Uh, there is a lot of interest in, in using artificial intelligence or, or data that's already available to our EPIC in, in, in alerting clinicians that they may be at, they, that a given patient may be at a higher risk of developing AKI. So, so in this particular, um, uh, visual abstract, what you're seeing is, is almost 700,000 patients at a VA, needless to say, all males. And uh, they had their database, which is a VA data set, both inpatients and outpatients. And they used that data set so they, they knew that, so you have the variables available to you, and then you know what the outcomes are a month later or a year later. Now you let the computer put one and one, one and two together, and you use that to train the computer to identify factors that were associated with an eventual increase in creatinine, right? As we keep developing that database, the computer was able to spit out fairly accurately 56% of the patients who were going to develop AKI within 48 hours, right? So now you have a 48 hours of lead time. Patients who were gonna develop dialysis, it were able to spit out almost 84% of the times. Where we still need to make this technology better, and I'm sure we are working on it diligently now. This was a really recent paper. I'm, I'm very confident within a, a, a short period of time, we'll be able to, to lower the false positive rate, which makes this technology less appealing right now. Because if it diagnoses one person accurately, it overdiagnosed two other people. And this is where we need to go back to the drawing table and, and try and, and improve this technology. But it looks like uh, the, the answer to the question, can AI predict future AKI? Yes. Can it predict accurately? Maybe not. So, so with all that said and done, you know, one of the things that, that you need to try and uh, always do as, as an internal medicine um, consultant on, on a person is and, and, a, and a provider to your patient is 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 do a, a due diligent workup for every patient that has come in and, and you've known and if you've noted that the patient's creatinine is elevated. So do a is good simple workup which is full blood count uh, but get a UA 
right? And, and get a urine microscopy for, for every patient. And here we go. Oh, we have urine dipstick and urine microscopy again. Why did I put it twice? Because I cannot tell you how many consoles do I get, and, and we do not have a UA. We, we, we usually have a urine uh, sodium or, or phena, and, and phena may be useful in some of those one out of two patients who are coming in pre-renal, but believe me, the pre-renal patients, you'll probably fix them within a day and they'll be going home the next day. Uh, one of my pet peeves is, is if your pre-renal patient, you, you admit a patient with a diagnosis of pre-renal AKI, and, and the next day the diagnosis is still there, either your patient does not have pre-renal AKI, which is very likely, or the doctor didn't know what they were doing. If the patient truly has pre-renal AKI, which happens sometimes that the patient is so volume depleted, but we do not replace all that volume um, in, in a timely fashion and it's delayed. But either way, the key part is that getting a good urine analysis like I pointed out earlier, is a extremely valuable biomarker and can tell us not only whether there is an injury to the kidney or not, but also alert us as to where that injury could be. If it is a leukocyte predominant microscopic exam in the urine, it is an interstitial, an inflammation of the kidney, whereas if it is dysmorphic red cells, I'm worried about tubular, in, uh, sorry, glomerular injury. And if it is tubular cells with granular cast, then I'm worried about a tubular injury in that patient. The further workup of acute kidney injury pretty much includes the entire textbook of nephrology. Uh, but, but I put together a list of conditions that you should kind of worry about um, a, and, and what investigations should you get to work up those conditions. So those are highly specific based on, on which condition are we looking at and, and uh, uh, what further investigations should be done. The key part is that you should try and identify all pre-renals through a good history, good physical exam, make sure they do not have a cardiac condition that does not allow perfusion to the kidney, make sure they're not persistently hypotensive and they cannot perfuse the kidney, make sure they're not volume depleted truly and they cannot perfuse the kidney, correct that, and make sure that they do not have an obstruction which can be very easily relieved. Every year we get several consults where all we do is walk up to the patient, put in a Foley, problem solved, the patient's AKI is resolved. It's probably the easiest $250 you will make uh, for, for a consult for acute kidney injury. Let's talk a little bit about how can we prevent acute kidney injury? Because I think that is an important part um, because acute kidney injury can have a long standing and it is the probably, it is the most common reason why people end up developing chronic kidney disease. Yes, it's not the diabetes, it's not the hypertension that is the most common reason why people develop CKD. AKI is up there with them. So if you can prevent the we can probably decrease the risk of, of chronic kidney disease. So, so it's another very interesting uh, visual abstract. A lot of information here, so let me just walk you through. So balanced crystalloids versus normal saline, right? So this debate has come up in more and more loudly in recent years. Uh, the logic being that normal saline is extremely acidic. The pH of normal saline is close to about 5.4, and it's a really complicated um, analysis as to why that is so. But when you infuse normal saline to patients, you're giving them 154 milliequivalents of sodium and 154 milliequivalents of chloride with every liter of water. In the blood, the amount of chloride is only 95 to 100 milliequivalents per liter. So when you infuse sodium chloride, you may be giving them a much higher chloride concentration. Um, and in that persistent infusion of normal saline will 
induce hyperchloremia, and that hyperchloremia can increase cell stress, cell stress, increase oxidative stress, and may be more detrimental to the body. So these two studies, I believe these both of these studies were done in Vanderbilt uh, University, and, and they did very simple things. So for a time of, of uh, of, of the hospital uh, stay, all patients who were getting admitted, 13,000 of them were divided into two groups. So they made sure that one group was only going to get lactated ringer predominantly or plasma light. They got lactated ringer, which is cheaper than plasma light for most of the people. Lactated ringer has a balanced formula with about 136 of sodium and, and a chloride of about 96. So now the, the, the solution balances and matches what the, the serum electrolytes look like. And, and the other half got saline. And they looked at what they call the major adverse kidney events, right? Or make 30. Hospital free days, they did not find any difference between the two groups, right? Make 30 events, they found that the balanced solutions had less risk of kidney injury, less risk of AKI. Those who had uh, stage two AKIs within the hospital or more didn't really have any, we didn't see any difference, but there was a trend towards less renal dysfunction when we use balanced solution. Now, the, if the same idea is applied to patients who are getting admitted into an ICU. That was a second study in the same uh, group of uh, physicians, and it's called the SMART trial. 15,000, 16,000 people, so almost 8,000 people in uh, patients in, in two groups. One of them got a balanced solution, and one of them got saline infusion only, right? And here, the results were even more pronounced. So remember, this is a much sicker population. It's going to have the risk of AKI is going to be much higher. The comorbidities are going to be much more. And the stress or the conserve or the ability of the kidney to adapt is probably going to be much less. So when they are subjected to a high chloride solution, the kidney adverse events are even high, are, are higher with saline in hospital mortality was was higher with saline compared to the balanced solution and the risk of dialysis was also a little higher so my take with this study and this data is that i'm i'm, I'm always cognizant of what my chloride is in my patient if i see my patient whose chloride is rising it's more than 104 and the bicarbonate is going down I'm going to stop using saline and probably use half normal saline. And that's another talk by itself as to which fluids and, and how should we pick different fluids in different patients. But in my opinion, normal saline is not a good fluid for maintenance in most of my patients. Most of my patients who just need maintenance, half normal saline does the job really well and, and should be the fluid of choice. right? But then when we are resuscitating some patients and, and they have a, a high chloride to begin with, I probably would use plasma light or a lactated ringer, provided there are no problems with their liver. Um, or in, in some of my medicine patients, I would probably use half normal saline with an amp of bicarb um, to, to give them more sodium, but not extra chloride. So again, there are ways by which you can tackle it. The key point is, watch the chloride and, and perhaps if you can um, prevent hypochloremic acidosis, uh, you can decrease the risk of AKI patients. Here's another uh, beautiful visual abstract um, looking at the risk of AKI after um, any surgery and, and we do see a, our share of patients who are post-op or, or we, we consulted on patients who are post-op and there's several factors that we should be looking at. And perhaps in future, EPIC can automatically alert us of our patients who may be at risk of renal hyperperfusion after surgery. If their blood pressures are lower than what they were before surgery, if the urine output is dropping, 
uh, patients who are on, on cardiopulmonary bypass, they may not be getting enough uh, um, oxygen to, to the kidney, patients who are in cardiogenic shock, sepsis, drugs. So all of these factors post-op can increase the risk of, of kidney injury, right? And then sometimes post-op, the patients in pain can have severe obstruction and, and you need to be aware of that and, and look for signs of urinary retention in these patients. If the surgery was in the lower pelvis, uh, a uterine surgery, a cervical surgery, worry about any injury to the to the tubules. And, and these are the patients that I would advocate getting a renal ultrasound right away so that we can rule out any urethral obstruction, which can be reversed and the injury will get better. It could be that the patients perioperatively may be at an increased risk of getting certain medications or say cholesterol embolization, somebody who get a heart cat, uh, patients who get say certain medications intra-op that can cause direct injury to their, to their kidney. And, and then I also like this abstract because it kind of listed all the risk factors that increase the risk of AKI. Right? Just having a chronic kidney disease, patients who are diabetic, patients who have liver disease, patients who have congestive heart failure and high blood pressure, these are patients who may have a very low reserve to begin with. And if they are subjected to further insult, further um, uh, stress, if you will, on the kidney, they will have a worsening acute kidney injury or a worsening uh, reinfection. Treatment. Uh, well, as of 2020, what April 27th, 2020, there is no treatment for acute kidney injury. I'll tell you, and um, there are a lot of promising substances that have been tried and tested. Uh, one of them that, that was really uh, presented at that, that last ASN uh, was, was nothing but vitamin B6, and, and it seemed like vitamin B6 may have a role in prevention of acute tubular injury in, in patients who may be at a higher risk of developing um, tubular injury. Um, so um, as of today, no active treatment, but hopefully in, in future we may. The treatment really impinges on an identification of the cause of that AKI and then reversing it. But I'm going to do a couple of visual abstracts and, and um, you know, review a couple of key important uh, pieces of information. The KDGO uh, recommends that all patients who are at a higher risk we go through a, a list of things to decrease the risk of AKI. And these are very simple things that we should be doing on a daily basis anyway, that we make to make sure the patients are not dehydrated, they're not um, you know, in, in any kind of hemodynamic instability. And if they are, we, we can put them on, on a flow track or, or monitor their, their cardiac outputs a little, little more closely. Um, watch the urine output, make sure that they, they uh, not get exposed to unnecessary uh, increased risk of, of contrast injury, right? And if they do develop uh, EKI and, and stage one or, or two or three, uh, we need to make sure that, that we look at their medications, uh, adjust all the medications to the renal dosing, uh, yada, yada, yada. But there are a few things that have been shown to be promising in, in patients with AKI and in preventing further injury. I'm going to go back to uh, the role of uh, acidemia as a stress to the body and stress to the kidney. Uh, this is a, a visual abstract um, from, uh, I believe, uh, uh, where they looked at patients who were admitted in... Uh, ICU, and these patients had severe acidemia on admission along with a elevated SOFA score. So they randomized these patients into two groups, patients where they did not give them bicarbonate versus the ones where they gave them bicarbonate and, and normalized their pH to 7.3, right? There was no difference in mortality. There was no difference in, in organ failure or a combination of that composite, but the patients when they normalize their bicarbonate, 
they they saw that there was a reduction in the need for a, for uh, dialysis in those patients, really significant, and they also saw that the risk of acute kidney injury type two was uh, much less when you decrease the acidemia um, within a timely fashion. So again, things that we can do to prevent injury or, or having severe injury. There's another interesting um, study that, that looked at uh, use of bedside ultrasound. You know, it's commonly available. I know we have ultrasound available on the floors now and ultrasound available in ICU. Right? So you have patients who are requiring dialysis, right? So these are AKI patients. It's a very common question that's asked on the wards every morning. How much fluid should we pull, right? And a very common term that, uh, that is used is, oh, we should try and challenge the patient or, or maybe we should try and uh, take X amount of fluid out. How do we decide that, right? A simple bedside ultrasound can be done to ascertain the risk of intradialytic hypotension or IDH. Right? IDH is defined as when the mean arterial pressures while on dialysis drops below 65. If the mean arterial pressures drop below 65, then the risk further to the kidney may actually go up. So your patient's kidney is already diseased and, and you create hypotension and hypotension related hypoperfusion to the kidney, which will further injure the kidney itself. And there are some speculation that, that patients who are dialyzed intermittently may have a higher risk of AKI versus those who not undergo any dialysis. Again, over the years, they've, they've kind of compared it and have not really found clear evidence of that, but that's speculation. So in this particular study, what they did was they looked at simple patients who were dialyzed and looked at the IVC collapsibility, right? So we, we know how to check for that. You, you look for the IVC and then look at the maximal diameter of the IVC with expiration and the collapse of the IVC as the minimum diameter with, with deep inhalation, right? And, and then you look at the, the collapsibility of the IVC. If it's less than 40%, that's a sign of hypervolemia a normal IVC should collapse as you as you breathe in. So in, in people where the IVC did not collapse, they did not develop IDH. Whereas if the IVC was collapsing before, uh, before you dialyze them, the chances of developing IDH was much, much higher, right? So a very simple tool, bedside tool, again, freely available. And I, I believe a bedside ultrasound should be used as a stethoscope these days because it does give us additional information. And I've been ab advocating uh, getting some handheld um, ultrasound machines, butterfly or, or um, something similar in that range, which is portable that you, we can carry around and, and uh, increase the, the use of um, point-of-care ultrasound to really help certain outcomes. I'm going to end with a three more studies here and three more visual abstracts. Um, these three are going to deal with when do we dialyze patients with acute kidney injury. Um, and there is a, a, a debate that has been ongoing about early versus late start of dialysis, right? So this is a German study, uh, ICU, 230 patients. Patients had AKI, AKI stage two or stage three, and they diagnosed them by checking their NGAL level. I, I told you earlier, NGAL has not been validated as a marker for uh, acute kidney injury yet. And all these, most of these patients had heart surgery, about half of them, and about 80% of the people had post-op AKI, right? So patients who had early start of CVV HDF or dialysis, these patients, the moment they develop kidney failure two, within eight hours, they started them on dialysis. 
Whereas the late start or delayed strategy was they waited for the AKI to go on all the way up to stage three AKI and then started them on dialysis. The mortality was lower when you had uh, stage two and early dialysis compared to the delayed dialysis. But the critique of the study is that perhaps some of those stage two AKIs never required dialysis. Remember, these were the, the patients who may spontaneously recover the, that AKI and, and starting them early may not have been that beneficial. And, and remember, most of these patients were post-op, so surgical ICU only, and may not apply to our MICU patients. Let's look at another um, visual abstract, and, and this is where um, a French uh, ICU study, again, 600 patients. Uh, this is the AKI-KI study, or the AKI-Akiki trial. Um, these, the study used only patients with AKI stage three, right? And these patients had to be on some vasopressors. And most of these patients were patients with sepsis, right? Here, the, the AKI early start was within three hours, within six hours of diagnosis of stage three AKI, they started them on dialysis, right? Whereas the late start was the patients developed stage three AKI, they waited till there was an absolute indication, let's say hyperkalemia, severe hypervolemia, or some other reason, and then they started them on dialysis. And in this particular study, obviously uh, the patients where we waited required dialysis much less, almost 50% less here, right? Obviously because almost 100% of the patients who developed AKI stage three started dialysis, but only 50% of the patients when we waited, really require dialysis, right? So that's really different. But other than that, there is no difference in outcomes. The mortality does not change. So dialysis does not save the patients. Just because we started the dialysis early and we spent more dollars, doesn't mean that, that we'll be able to save those patients better. The vasopressor free days were no different. The mechanical ventilation was no difference, yes, there, there is some, but statistically, there is no difference between the mechanical ventilation days as well. So when do we start dialysis still remains unclear, and, and, and uh, we really don't have a clear answer for that. And there was another study, I'm not going to go into details of that, but also did not show any significant difference in, in outcomes. So let's kind of summarize. Um, so my take home, or, or if you guys are listening from home, already at home points for you are... AKI, um, the, the patients are not the same, and the risk of AKI differs widely based on who is the individual that's walking through those doors. The young, healthy people are not at risk of AKI, or clinical AKI, I would say. They may go up subclinical AKI today, but if that keeps happening over months and years and years, Think of that diabetic patient who's been admitted 10 times and has had 10 CT scans. And, and the first five, seven, eight were not clinically evident, but eventually things are gonna catch up with you and then now you develop a clinical AKI and it's already gonna to be too late. Look for the delta change in creatinine from baseline, right? And keep watching the urine output. You should be able to pick up minor changes and in put them in, in numbers and, and diagnose and, and stage your patients between AKI 1, 2, 3. It does have prognostic significance and does alert you to a higher risk of mortality within the hospital. Get a UA early. It should be the first test for every elevated creatinine. And, and if you are worried about some patients who may be at risk of developing AKI, get a UA on them too and look for changes, subtle changes. Spin the urine in a urine lab and, and look for renal tubular cells or tubular injury or, or interstitial cells in somebody who's maybe developing a, a UTI and, and may, may alert you for an impending kidney failure. As an internist, I think it's imperative that 
the first time you see creatinine being elevated, you need to rule out within hours a pre and post renal as a cause of creatinine elevation. The pre renal, a good history, should alert you for the risk of pre renal and a simple UA with an elevated specific gravity and a simple UA that does not have any signs of renal injury, no cells, no cast. All it has is a maybe highline cast and an elevated specific gravity suggesting a concentrated urine is a hallmark of pre-renal API. We really don't need to worry a whole lot about getting a fena. If you want to get an absolute urine sodium alone, a urine sodium of less than 20 is suggesting that the kidney is trying to do what it can to hold back all the volume, hold back all the sodium, hold back all the um, the intravascular space as, and preserve it as, as well as it can. Post-renal, think of your poster child, think of a person who's had a recent surgery, an elderly male with an enlarged prostate. And if you have a patient who fits that profile, look for signs of a, of a distended bladder, a simple percussion on the, on the hypogastric area. And if it's a dull percussion, should alert you that the bladder is full. And, and you put in a Foley and or get a bedside bladder ultrasound. You know, we, can, we can estimate the amount of urine in the bladder. And that can tell us uh, whether there is an obstruction or not. And fix it. And if you ruled out pre and post, now you're left with the renal. That, that slide that I showed earlier. Um, can can be a basis, so you think in your head, you try and get a good urine again, look for clues. Are there any tubular cells? Are there any signs of glomerular injury? Is there proteinuria present on that? And then look through the history and see how you can put one and one together. So I'm going to thank you again for listening if you've lasted this long. Um, and if you have any questions or interesting cases that you see, I'm going to urge you that you sign up on Twitter and uh, you can follow me at Kidney LSU. You can follow our department at Kidney OLSU or make sure you follow your own department, LSUHS underscore IM for LSU Internal Medicine uh, Twitter account. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the day.